My name is Mark Benziquin. I'm the manager of the investor services team at the OIC. I'm going to be talking about the options collar. Ed and Jamal briefly touched on it. I'm going to get a little bit more detailed about what the options collar is and why we use it, and then look at it in a couple different ways than you might have originally thought. Before we do, the disclaimer that everybody has seen, options involve risks, may not be suitable for everybody. To keep things simple today, we're not going to be talking about commissions and fees and things like that. And then also the uh, strategies and concepts that we're going to be looking at are simply from an educational standpoint, uh, not being a, a direct recommendation by OIC. OIC, again, we provide free and unbiased education. We do that mainly through our website, optionseducation.org. We've got online courses, podcasts, videos. We do our live webinars twice a month, and then quarterly we're doing live in-person sessions around the country as well. Um, the pride and joy of the OIC is our options, um, uh, our investor services help desk. Uh, myself and Bill are part of that team. You can reach us at any time. Options at the OCC.com is our email. So let's go ahead and get started with the final session today, unique twists on the options collar. And before I get into our outline, I just want to comment on a couple things that I saw, some questions coming from our online audience. The concepts that we talked about today, that Ed talked about, the protective put and Jamal about ratio spreads, these aren't easy topics. These aren't things that just instinctively and instinctually come to investors, that they you know, listen to our presentation, they look at the slides and say to themselves, boy, I get it. I'm going to talk to my broker Monday. I'm going to sign on, on to my online platform on Monday, and I'm going to go ahead and employ a stock repair strategy, or I'm going to put on a put back, uh, put back spread. The reason I say this is that we're not expecting you to leave here today and be experts with what we're talking about. Some of the stuff may be over your head. Some of the stuff may not necessarily make sense initially. Luckily, all of these sessions are recorded. Um, for those of you in person, you can simply contact us on Monday. And we'd be happy to get you a link to uh, listen to the replay of the event. For those of you attending online, the link that you used to join us today will allow you to view the replay. The reason I'm mentioning this is repetition. The more you hear something again and again, uh, the more you're going to learn. At least that's what I tell my children. When they hear me to tell them to clean their room 100 times, eventually maybe they'll actually do it. Uh, the, the point being is that if you just walk away with a little bit of information, if you walk away with 5 or 10 or 20 percent of what we're talking about, if just one concept clicks, right, then you're certainly ahead of the game. So. Uh, again, I don't want anyone to feel frustrated. I don't want anyone to feel that, boy, you know, listen to that book back spread or listening to, uh, you know, some of these uh, different things about the options collar. Options just aren't for me. They're just too hard. They're too complex to understand. Not necessarily the case. There's plenty of basic strategies out there that you can learn. And something that Ed had alluded to is that if you can just take, you know, we were talking about market bias. If you can just take one or two strategies for a bullish bias or a bullish forecast, one or two strategies for neutral, one or two for bearish, then you're well ahead of the game. You don't need to know everything about options. You don't need to know all of the dozens of strategies out there. If you just have a few right in your quiver for you know, various um, market situations and know those inside and out, know what to expect, know what the risks are, know what the rewards are, you're going to do pretty well for yourself. So if some of this is over your head, don't feel frustrated. Certainly make use of our investor services team, and we'll be happy to walk you through it. So getting back to the collar, we're going to talk about what the collar is and why we use it, the traditional collar. And we're going to look at choosing strikes and expiries. That's one of the uh, more frequent questions that we get. You know, I've got a stock that I want to invest in or I want to protect or something like that, a position I want to protect, but I don't know how far out I should go. I don't know what strikes I should choose. How do I go about doing that? So we're going to look at that, and then we're going to look at some twists on the collar. Aside from the basic uh, collar that we trade, we're going to look at what's known as a staggered expiry. Uh, we're going to look at a put spread collar. And then we're also going to look at what we call a laddered collar. So a couple different twists on a classic uh, hedging strategy. 
So we're going to look at all of those today, and then obviously we're going to leave plenty of time for Q&A. Uh, let's first start with a question. How many of you have ever traded a collar? Okay, a few of you. How many of you are familiar with what a collar is? Okay, excellent. Uh, so we've got a, a little bit of basis about uh, you know, what we're going to get into, and, and we'll take a much deeper dive. So a collar is basically two strategies in one, the first of which is the protected put, which Ed spoke about earlier this morning. So I'm not going to get too far into detail about what the protected put is. Uh, protected put, simply, we're looking to protect a long stock position. We're looking again uh, to protect against a decrease in the share price or a decrease in the market. And we're doing that by buying a put, typically out of the money. And we buy that put because uh, we're looking to sell stock if shares happen to plummet. We're looking to sell stock at a fixed price, okay? And that strike price is going to determine the price at which we can sell that stock. So in terms of uh, strike selection, right? Strike selection, as Ed had mentioned, it's, it's, it's paramount to the protected put. That determines where we can get rid of, those, uh, rid of those shares. So depending on what that strike price is, we can get rid of those shares uh, at a higher price, at a lower price, and obviously there's going to be a cost involved. So that strike price, that's going to determine our exit price. Our profit with the protected put is still in that long stock position. If we don't exercise that put, we're going to make money if the stock goes up. So one of the good things about the protected put is it allows us price appreciation. Um, it, because we are the option buyer, obviously we're in the driver's seat. We have the ability to control our trade. As uh, Ed and Jamal had mentioned earlier, you know, if stock happens to plummet, well, you know, we can decide, do we want to exercise our put and sell those shares? Do we want to sell the put back to the market? You know, we are in control. So one of the great things about buying options, whether it's, you know, buying puts, buying calls, buying spreads, what have you, everything is our decision. So uh, option buyers have the right to decide whether or not to exercise. They control the destiny of the trade. And a quick snapshot um, of the protected put. And one thing I also wanted to mention, I noticed that some of you were taking uh, photos of our screen of the slides. For those of you in person, you should have received a link to download this present, uh, presentation materials. If you haven't, give us a call or uh, contact us on Monday. We'll be happy to get you a copy of uh, you know, everything that we've spoken about today. So the structure of the protected put, simply we're long 100 shares of stock or more. Uh, and then we are long an appropriate number of puts. Uh, again, as Ed, as Ed had mentioned, it doesn't necessarily need to be one-to-one. -one. If you're long 500 shares of stock, maybe you want to protect half the portfolio. So you buy two or three puts against it. But the, the whole point of it, our motivation, is that we're looking to protect against the downside. Our forecast, we're bullish but cautious. Our risk is going to be the deductible plus the, the uh, premium paid. And remember uh, from Ed's presentation that deductible is simply the difference between the share price and our strike price. Unlimited reward, we participate with the appreciation of the stock as it goes up. Because we're option buyers, we have no assignment risk. So in a nutshell, that's the protected put. Obviously, there's much more of it. Uh, uh, on our website and again uh, give us a call or drop us an email if you want to talk about it. Now the other side of the protected put is the covered call and now that's not something that we had addressed today uh, but a covered call is basically uh, a fairly simple uh, options strategy something that I'm sure uh, the majority of you are familiar with I'm sure the majority of you have even uh, you know possibly traded. A covered call we're simply selling an option. We're selling a call against our long stock. The reason we're doing that is because we're lowering our cost basis, for example. We're looking for additional income from our stock. You know, if we own shares of stock and the stock doesn't go anywhere, how much money have we made? Well, none, right? Uh, if the stock doesn't move, we don't profit. We don't lose, we don't profit. With the covered call, that premium that we collect uh, allows us to profit off of the stock even in a stagnant marketplace. Now the trade-off is going to be the strike that we select with the covered call is the the price at which uh, we are obligating ourselves to deliver those shares. So should we get assigned, we're obligated to sell at the strike price. Um, 
with the collar, rather than using that premium that we collect for income, we're using it to offset the cost for that protection. Uh, there used to be, uh, for those of you in the Chicago area, the, you know, those of you joining us today, there used to be a commercial for a, a muffler company, Midas Muffler, and their tagline was, you know, I'm not going to pay a lot for that muffler. Kind of the same thing here with the options. We want the protection, but we really don't want to pay for it. So the collar is certainly a strategy that we use because the covered call that we're selling, that is going to pay for that protection. So we're not paying a lot for that protection. Uh, and then again, the covered call, just at a quick glance, we're long shares of stock, we sell a call against it. With the covered call by itself, we're neutral to moderately uh, bullish on the stock. We're not looking for deep price appreciation, and we've got very little protection on the downside. Now, when we put them together, that's the options collar. And the reason that we use that is we want that protection on the downside that we talked about, but we don't want to pay a lot for it. Not only that, we're also looking for uh, potential price appreciation that we can take advantage of. But we're willing to give up a lot of that upside in order to pay for that protection. So the key benefits of the uh, options collar is that the cost of the put is uh, paid for in full or at least in part by the sale of the call. And regardless of what happens to the stock, our objectives are going to be met, meaning if the stock declines in value, we're protected on the downside. And that was the whole point of buying the put to begin with, right? If stock appreciates in value, we get a little bit of that appreciation before our stock gets called away. So if the stock goes up a little bit, we're okay. We're going to generate some income from that. Hopefully, if stock goes down a little bit, we'll be okay as well. If the stock plummets, well, that's where our protection kicks in. Another thing about the collars, because we're long shares, as long as we hold on to that short call, as long as we're not assigned, we get any dividends from that stock that, uh, that comes into play. Now, the key here is assignment. If dividends are approaching, the likelihood of that short call getting assigned is substantially greater. So something that I always tell people when it comes to stock versus options, uh, as Warren Buffett is, is fond to say, when you buy stock, a lot of them you just put in a drawer and you forget about them. Options are absolutely not that way. Options are living, breathing uh, entities. Options you need to manage. You need to monitor. You always need to be cognizant of what's going on with the market. You need to be cognizant of what's going on with the company itself. Is there a corporate event coming up? Are there dividends? Are there earnings? Something like that. So, you know, the wheels are always in motion. Uh, your brain is always uh, looking into the position and, and seeing what's on the horizon and how best to manage that position. So with the collar, because we're short that call, We've got that obligation of assignment, which is uh, a very likely or a very real, not necessarily a threat, but something to be concerned with around dividends. Okay? Have any of you had a covered call, for example, and you were unlikely or you were assigned early because of a dividend event that maybe you weren't anticipating? Sir, you were? Uh, sir? Okay. So, you know. That's the issue when it comes to selling uh, options, particularly selling calls, is that early assignment. If the dividend amount is greater than the time value of the option, and, and you know, time premium, this isn't something that we're going to be getting into with this presentation, but if the dividend amount is greater than the time value of the option, then that option is a candidate for early assignment. So if we've got the covered call on, or if we've got a options collar on, we need to be aware of that dividend event and the possibility of that call getting uh, assigned and that stock getting called away. Okay. So what does all of this cost? The, you know, the idea of the collar is that, again, we don't want to pay a lot for this muffler. So let's see how much we're going to pay. In this example, stock is trading $75. We're looking about 45 days out to expiry for a particular event. Let's say we've got earnings, um, some kind of a drug trial that the results are coming in, uh, you know, some other corporate event that is going to potentially adversely affect our long stock position. So we're looking 45 days out, and the idea being is that we're looking for protection for 
uh, a 10% move to our downside. As Ed had mentioned earlier, the difference between the share price and our strike price, that's going to be the deductible. Okay? Um, so we're looking for something beyond that 10%. We're looking to buy insurance for this portfolio. 10% from a $75 share price, that's going to give us a $67.5 strike. So in this particular case, again, the strike reveals itself. Our forecast and our motivation is that we're looking for protection against the 10% down move. We know where stock is trading or where we're long stock to begin with. So our strike price has already uh, been made. In this case, the market's uh, one and a quarter at $1.35. Because only suckers ever pay retail, we are going to put in a $1.30 bid, and that's where we get filled. Right? So we buy the 67 and a half put, we pay $1.30 for it. Now that we know what that protection is going to cost, we've got to figure out a way to pay for it. If we're okay with spending the $130 per option contract, on that insurance, then we're done. Then we just have a protective put on. But because we don't want to pay a lot, we're going to go ahead and look at an appropriate call to pay for that put, the, the premium that we receive from that call to pay for that put that we just bought. We look at our option chain and we say, well, we can sell the 80 strike call, for example, at $1.30, and we can do the spread for a no cost, what we would call a $0 collar. But if we sell the $80 call, how much price appreciation does that give us from $75 to $80? We can only appreciate uh, or uh, participate in a $5 move of the stock. And maybe we think that, you know, that's not enough. We're, you know, maybe a little bit more bullish on the stock than that, and we don't want to sell shares out at 80. But we'd be willing to sell shares out at 80, 82 and a half, let's say. So we look on our chain, 82 and a half call. Theoretically, we can sell that for 90 cents, which we do. So for the entire spread, we're paying 40 cents. And somebody had uh, asked a question earlier. I'm not sure if it was online or in person. Do we do this trade all at once? Or you know, do we leg into it, something like that? One ticket, one trade. When we're talking about the collar, that's preferably w what we want to do. And, and actually, you know, any multi-leg trade that you want to do uh, or any multi-leg strategy that you want to do, ideally, one ticket, one trade. Legging into a spread, uh, I was a broker on the, on the uh, trading floor for about 17 years, legging into a spread can be extraordinarily dangerous. You can get filled on one leg and not the other, and now your risk-reward profile is completely upside down from what you were looking. And you've got a, a, a tremendous amount of market risk that you weren't expecting. So preferably, one ticket, one trade. So we've got our spread, uh, 40 cents debit. We long shares from 75. We bought the 67 and a half put for $1.30. Remember, that's our 10% downside protection. And as you can see from our chart, at 67 and a half, uh, if you go down, you see it flat lines there. So anything below that, we're covered. Stock can go to zero and it's not going to affect us because we were able to sell those shares at 67 and a half. So our maximum loss is going to occur should shares drop below 67 and a half. Now to pay for that protection, remember we had to give up some of our upside participation. So that's where the 82 and a half strike comes in that we sold. So anything above 82 and a half, we would expect our stock to get called away. Again, that's where you see our profit flat line. Anything above 82 and a half, those shares get called away and we're maxed out. Between the two strikes, our profit and loss is going to be determined by you know, where shares are. And, and one thing that I, I should preface with uh, that Ed had uh, again mentioned earlier, this is at expiration. So at expiration of shares finished below 67 and a half, at expiration of shares finished above 82 and a half. We paid 40 cents for the spread. That gives our break-even point of 75.40. It's going to be our share price plus or minus the credit or the debit that we receive. Uh, our maximum profit, again, uh, maximum loss. It's going to be determined by our strike price versus our share price and what we paid into it. So this is the traditional collar, okay? We buy a put. To pay for that put, we sell a call against it. That protects our stock. Now. How do we manage the position? What happens if, in this case, 
What happens if stock plummets? What happens if stock goes down to 50? Right? Well, we're covered from the put, so we may choose to go ahead and exercise that put and simply sell those shares. And, uh, you know, we, we live to play another day. We uh, achieve that maximum loss or we hit that maximum loss, but now we're out of the trade. We've protected our stock, which was our whole goal to begin with, and, and we're okay. What if our motivation has changed? Or what if our forecast has changed? Every time that we do a trade, whether we're buying a call, whether we're trading a spread, whether we're doing a butterfly or a condor or what have you, it's going to start with two things. It's going to start with our forecast or the market bias. What do we think is going to happen and how long is it going to take to get there? And it starts with our motivation. Why are we doing the trade? Are we doing it to make money, you know, income? Are we doing it to protect our portfolio, protect our stock? Are we looking to buy stock maybe below market prices? Are we looking for leverage? You know, what is the motivation that we're doing for the trade? And that, th those two criteria, forecast and motivation, we don't just look at those when we put the trade on. We're looking at those on a daily basis. Has our forecast changed? Has our motivation changed? If so, then how do we manage the position? So in this case, what if share price, what if stocks plummet? Well, again, we can simply sell our stock. Uh, we collect the funds from that, right? Uh, you know, we get that capital, and now we can put on another trade. Or do we simply sell that put back to the market because share prices decreased? We'd expect put prices to what? Come on, put prices to what? Thank you. Right, this is Chicago, right? Everybody, everybody can vote at least once. All right, everyone's got a voice, and then and more than that. So stocks plummet, stock price drops, put prices increase. What if our motivation has changed? What if our forecast has changed? What if we think that that decline was just a temporary dip? And that's probably a phrase that I'm sure everyone's familiar with, buy the dip, right? So what if we think that's just a temporary decrease? Do we want to go ahead and sell those shares? Or do we want to sell that put back to the market for a profit, hold on to our shares, and now, now we've got a covered call position on. We're long shares, and now we're short a call. Or do we want to roll the strikes? You know, maybe our, our forecast has changed. Maybe you know, we're uh, not looking for quite as much protection anymore. So maybe we close out this trade and put one on at uh, lower strikes. Maybe we lo are looking for protection for next month now. Maybe we roll out. Maybe we roll down. Maybe we roll out. The point being is there's a lot of different things. Because we bought that put, we control what happens to the trade. We're in the driver's seat. So we have the decision to make as to what we want to do. Now, on the flip side, well, it, actually, let me, let me get uh, this first. If stock doesn't go anywhere, shares remain flat. Again, has our forecast changed? Has our motivation changed? If stock doesn't move, and we're approaching expiration, do we really need that protection? If we don't need that protection, maybe we try to sell that put out, try to recoup some of our uh, cost if we can. Again, now we've got a covered call on. Maybe we buy that back to close. The point being is that we're always going to be looking at different ways to manage that position based on our ever-changing forecast, ever-changing motivation. Okay. Things go the opposite way. Stock rallies. We're expecting our short call to get assigned. Are we okay with that? Are we okay letting our stock go for whatever that short call uh, uh, strike price is? Do we still need that protection? Remember, we thought stock was going to go down, and it, we were wrong, and it's gone up. Has anyone ever been wrong on a stock before? Right? <laughs> Unfortunately, most of us are more wrong than right. So uh, the, the point being here is, again, it's just another example of has our forecast changed, has our motivation changed. If we were looking for that downside protection, we no longer need it. Well, maybe we close out that put. Maybe we are looking for that protection uh, six weeks down the road. So maybe we roll out the spread. Again, the point being is there's always a way to manage that position based on your forecast and your motivation. So because traders love to trade, just doing a standard collar is, bless you, 
just doing a standard color may not be as exciting. Uh, traders are always looking to do something different. They're always looking to come up with new ways to trade, new ways to protect their position, new ways to generate income, and they love putting a name to it. They love putting a name like an iron butterfly or an iron condor or a jade dragon or a twisted lizard or whatever you know, ridiculous names that happen to, you know, come to come to somebody. We used to do a trade on the trading floor. It was a one by two by three ratio that uh, uh, Jamal was uh, kind of talking about a little bit, but we called it a butterfuco. Um, you know, not everything has a name, but we would have customers that would, would call us and say, hey, I want to do this trade. Is there a name to it? And we'd say, no, but we'll make one up for you. And they loved that. So anyways, we've got what we call a staggered collar. Your traditional collar is simply, you've got your stock, You've got your long put, your short call, all same expiration. Well, what if we were looking for longer dated protection, right? Maybe we weren't just looking to protect against earnings. Maybe we were thinking, look, we've got a big portfolio. I spoke with a gentleman the other day uh, who had a couple million dollar portfolio in the S&P and was looking for a way to protect it. So he's got a, you know, a sizable portfolio and he's not just looking to protect it for the next week or the next six weeks. He was looking to protect it for the next year and beyond. So maybe buying a longer dated put is something that would you know, be welcome for long-term protection, but what if we sold shorter dated calls against it and kept churning those calls month after month or expiration after expiration? What would, the, what would it, that look like, number one, and also what would our concerns be? Well, we would be concerned with the cost of the trade. Obviously, the shorter dated calls are going to generate shorter premium that we receive. So the greater cost of the trade up front. Also, we're worried about risk of assignment. Again, in, you know, we would be worried about getting assigned maybe in the case of a dividend on a monthly basis or you know, as often as we sold those calls. Theta is also a consideration, something that uh, Ed and Jamal had talked about earlier, that time decay. It works quicker for shorter dated options, obviously, than longer dated options. So in this case, Theta would be working in our favor because we want those short options to go to zero. Also management. Uh, again, as I just mentioned, you're going to be looking at it again and again. And now that you've got a position that expires this month and next month and the month after, so on and so forth, it's going to require more management. So it's going to be a more active trade, more moving parts, you know, things that we want to be concerned with. So let's start out with the, that time decay because that's really a big component of when it comes to selling options. Faster time decay for shorter dated options, right? The theta really kicks in about uh, four to six weeks out. If you sell an option expiring two years from now, that theta is going to be minimal. You're, you're really not even going to notice it on a day-to-day -day basis. As Ed had mentioned, on expiration day, theta is a 100% accelerator. An option worth a dime at uh, you know, 8.30 a.m. at the open of the market can be worth zero at the end of the day, so 100% decay. The point being is shorter dated options have uh, greater faded decay, greater time decay, and that works in our favor uh, as option sellers. So the staggered collar, one of these, uh, an advantage of these shorter dated options is that time decay. You'll also notice if any of you look on your option chains, if you look at the pool of market participants for an option expiring next week versus an option expiring two years from now. You're going to see those bid-ask markets typically much tighter and the size of those markets much greater, right, as you would, say, two years out. If I'm an option seller, I'm not going to be all that excited about selling an option two years down the road when I have no idea what's going to happen, especially in this you know, socioeconomic and political climate that we find ourselves in. Who knows what's going to happen down the road? I'd be okay with selling it a week from now, right? And so what that means is that there may be a larger pool of market participants in the short term than the long term. And well, what does that mean? You know, we talked about uh, options are simply a function of supply and demand, right? The greater uh, the demand for an option in the short run, you've got more people wanting to buy shorter dated options, the greater the demand for that is going to drive up prices. As an option seller, that's what I'm looking for. I want to be able to sell for a higher price to you know, uh, 15,000 market participants to one guy who's 
you know, the only one commanding a bid or the only one that's uh, putting a bid out there. So shorter dated options, you may have uh, 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 the opportunity to get a better price for that option as opposed to longer dated. Now, the longer dated option obviously is going to have a higher price, but uh, it may be more favorable uh, in the sense to a fair value of the shorter dated options. Now, what are the disadvantages? As I just mentioned, shorter dated options are going to have less time premium. You can sell an option for $10 expiring two years from now. You could sell the same strike at a dollar expiring next week. You know, I'll take the $10 over the dollar any day, except for the fact that obviously there's a lot more risk. Who knows what's going to happen down the road? And then also what we had, assume, uh, what we had alluded to was the management. If you're going to be selling that option 30 days and then 30 days and then 30 days and so on and so forth, more management is going to need to be um, put on for the trade. We're going to need to keep our eyes uh, open all the time, and we've got more chances to be assigned. We can be assigned on this weekly call, on the next weekly call, on the next weekly call, et cetera. Um, with a longer dated option, you know, say two years from now, for example, early assignment is, is rare. It's not very likely because of that great amount of time premium. With a shorter dated option, whether it's early assignment or just assignment in general, obviously the likelihood is much greater because that time premium shrinks. So let's look at our scenario here of a, a staggered collar and, and see what it's all about. So due to better than expected earnings, Tom's enjoyed a run up in the share price of this hypothetical soft drink company called Bubble. It's long 100 shares of stock from 82. It's currently trading 96, right? A heck of a trade, Tom. Pro to protect some of those uh, unrealized gains that he's got, his broker says, hey, what about trading an option collar? You can trade a protected put, but to pay for it, let's sell a call against it also. That's our options collar. So we look at our option chain, and we decide that we want some long-term protection, or I should say Tom decides he wants long-term protection, and he's looking all the way out to December. Stock is uh, $82 is where he's long. It's currently trading 96 he looks at the chain and says, you know what? I'm okay with 92 and a half. I'm okay with a little bit of pullback on the share price. I'll still get plenty of uh, profit from where I bought my stock. Uh, so I'm going to look at uh, dumping the stock at 92 and a half if, if things start going south from here. Pays $11.20 for that put. Now, where is he looking to sell the call? Certainly he can choose a December call to sell against that put and pay for the position entirely, right? But uh, what he's actually looking to do is he says, if I keep selling these shorter dated calls and if things go my way, I might be able to generate an even greater return over the course of the next, uh, what, six to eight months as opposed to just selling that decent call outright. So what Tom decides is, I'd like a little bit more price appreciation, so I want to go above where the stock is currently trading. I'm going to sell an out of the money call. And he chooses the 100 strike, the April 100 strike. 275 is what he collects. So to lock in some of that profit, he's buying the insurance in the form of the long put. He's paying for it by selling that uh, shorter dated call. With the idea being, if that call doesn't get called away, he's going to keep churning it. He's going to sell it again next month or six weeks out depending on the uh, the expiry and he's going to do it again and he's going to do it again if gods were willing if we had the chance to sell this april call at 275 or a similar strike each expiration period up until december we would generate a substantially a greater return than uh, what could we have sold it for initially we could have sold it for uh, the december 100 strike call for eight bucks by churning that position, we could sell 275, sell it again, sell it again. Three expiration periods would kind of break even on where we could be versus where we could have been by selling the Ds. Do it again. Now we're selling it for more money aggregately than we would had we just sold outright. And the idea being is you do it again and again and again and again until that protection is up. So each sale of that shorter dated call, assuming we don't get assigned, 
is going to reduce the cost basis of that long put. That theta is going to work in our favor. Remember, the idea with option sellers, we want that option to go from X price down to zero as quickly as possible. The shorter dated options are going to give us that ability versus the longer. But it also comes with risks. You know, with everything with options. There's no risk without reward, no reward without risk. So the risk is what if the, sh the stock drops sharply? Stock drops sharply. Now we're in danger of that short dated call getting exercised. You know, which is okay necessarily. Uh, um, I'm sorry, that long put, let me backtrack for a second. Stock drops sharply. We may decide to exercise that long put. Again, we're in the driver's seat. We have the choice to do what we want. The problem being, if we exercise that long put, we're out of the trade. So we sold the shorter dated call at 275 when we could have collected $8, right? So we're actually leaving some money on the table by uh, selling those shorter dated calls. We're leaving money on the table versus the longer if we exercise the position prior to the expiration. Again, we're going to look at our forecast, look at our motivation. Maybe we decide to hold the put, again, a temporary dip, right? Maybe we don't want to exercise the, the uh, strike just yet. Temporary dip, we go ahead and hold on to it, hope that the stock comes, uh, comes back a little bit. Stock moves sharply higher. This is where we kind of run into a problem in the sense that, uh, again, assignment is going to result in those shares get call, getting called away. The fact that we sold a maybe a 30-day call or a 45-day call as opposed to a six-month call, the chances of that same strike option getting called away are certainly greater four or six weeks with expiration or with a four to six week expiration versus a six month expiration simply because of that time value. So what do we do? If we feel that we're in danger of getting exercised or getting assigned, I should say, and we don't want to give up those shares, well, maybe we roll up our strike. We buy the position back, we roll up the strike a little bit, give us a little bit more um, price appreciation on the upside. Maybe we roll out that short call and it's, it's about to expire. It's a four week call, it's about to expire. Maybe we buy it back and we sell another four week call or a six week call, what have you. The point being is if we don't want that option to get called away or that stock to get called away, we can simply roll out and live to play again. That's the staggered collar. Long-term protection, and we sell shorter data calls against it to try to churn um, additional profits as the, uh, you know, as the year goes along. Now, there's another thing that we have called a put spread collar. Put spread collar is very similar to the traditional. Uh, it gives us that downside protection. We pay for some of that protection by selling uh, the call against it, but we're also selling a further out of dated put, uh, further out of the money put. The reason being with the traditional collar, it provides us protection from our long put strike all the way to zero. Okay? Has anyone ever had stock that actually went to zero? Not has anybody, but have any of you had stock that actually went to zero? You have, you have, you have. Wow, that's unfortunate. The point being is, is <laughs> sorry about that. You know, it's, it, it's funny. One of the things that we used to say on the floor when it came to trading options is uh, if, you wanna, uh, if you ever want to make a small fortune trading options, start out with a large fortune. <laughs> um, the, the, the point of all this is I'm sure that when the stock declines, it wasn't trading $50 one night and you woke up the next morning and it's zero. So, you know, typically you've got some time to manage that. The point of it is, is what if you're expecting some, what if you're looking for downside protection? Because, you know, maybe there's going to be a 10% decline or a 20% decline, but you certainly don't think it's going to zero, right? Certainly hope it's not. If you thought it was going to go to zero, you may just dump it right then. But what if you thought there would just be a modest decline, you didn't need protection all the way to zero, but you wanted it within a certain range? Because that's the only range that you need. 
again, it's kind of like uh, the analogy I think Ed used earlier about you know buying um, four hundred thousand dollars worth of homeowners insurance when you only have a three hundred thousand dollar house. Why buy all of that downside protection to zero when we only really need it for maybe ten to twenty percent? Uh, again, option traders are always they're always looking to build a better mousetrap, right? And, and that's kind of where this put spread collar comes in. The likelihood of those shares going to zero, if you certainly don't expect it to, why buy all of that protection? So what we're going to do is we're going to sell a further out of the money put. We've got our long stock. We've got our short out of the money call. We've got our long out of the money put. That's our traditional collar. Then because we don't think the stock is going to you know, implode, we're going to sell another further out on the money put, not only to pay for the entire trade as a whole, but likely we'll even receive a credit for it. And let's look at an example of that. So Karen, Karen buys 500 shares of this athletic wear company, Jogger. Do you guys like the trading acronyms that I came up with, by the way? Jogger, bubble, kind of fun stuff. ABC, XYZ, right, gets a little boring. So we try to, we're trying to jazz things up a little bit. So 500 shares of Jogger, long-term potential, upcoming earnings event she's a little nervous about. She thinks there may be a temporary dip in the stock. Certainly doesn't think it's going to go to zero. So she's looking for some downside protection. She's got a couple different options, no pun intended. Uh, she's got a couple different options. She can just simply buy that protective put that Ed had talked about. It's going to give her all of that protection down to zero. She could do a standard collar around her position. Again, protection all the way down to zero. That short call uh, you know, pays for some of that protection. Or because she doesn't think she needs the protection all the way down to zero, She's only going to buy as much protection as she needs, and that's where the put spread collar comes in. So here's our scenario, 500 shares of stock. She's long from 105. It's currently trading 120. She decides, I'm willing to accept, currently trading 120, remember. I'm willing to, I, I think there's going to be a small temporary downturn, so I want to get rid of those shares at, say, 115. So she buys the 45-day 115 put for 360, looking for a little upside participation uh, to pay for that put by selling the out-of-the-money call, the one and a quarter call, collects three dollars for that. That's our traditional collar. She could put the traditional collar on, pay 60 cents per option contract. All right, she could do that if she's if she needs all of that downside protection to zero. She doesn't think she does. You remember we were talking about forecast and motivation. Forecast isn't just where you think the stock is going to go, meaning I think the stock's going to go up, right? Or I think the stock's going to go down. Well, that's not all that insightful. Where is it going to go up? How, to what point will it increase? How long is it going to take to get there? Is it going to go down to 110 and then you know, bounce back and rally? You know, those are all the things that investors need to ask themselves, not just up or down necessarily. So because she doesn't think it's going to drop much below, she says, look, I want some protection from 115, but the worst that would happen is the stock might go down to, say, 105, but beyond that, I'm not concerned. Stock's nowhere, uh, not a chance that it's going to touch that. So Rather than pay 60 cents for the traditional collar, I can sell another out of the money put, the 105 put, for which I can collect $1.60. Now, rather than paying 60 cents for the trade, I just put the trade on for what? A, a dollar credit. I'm putting some money back in my pocket. I've got the protection I need. I've got some upside pricing appreciation. So that's all good. And I'm getting paid for it, right? That sounds fantastic. Obviously, the problem is, as we'll look uh, very shortly, is that if that forecast is wrong, that could be a problem. So here's our quick scenario. And again, a lot of numbers. For me, it's easier to look at charts than tables. But as you can see here, the put spread on the upside, if stock appreciates in value, put spread's going to expire worthless. Uh, no big deal there. The short call is going to be in the money, so she's going to lose some money there. 
However, the stock is going to appreciate in value. She participates in that. She's capped out. So anything above that short call strike, the 125, that's where the profit is going to be capped out. Anywhere between her put spread, the 105 and the 115, shares finish anywhere between there at expiration, she's protected. So you can see between 105 and 115, we've got an $11 profit. The reason being is she sells shares at 115, exercising that put. Typically, she can buy those shares back or she may be assigned, buy those shares back for uh, 105, depending on where they are trading. She locks in $10 of profit on the stock, plus a dollar on the strategy, on the spread. Problem is when shares continue to plummet. Her forecast is wrong. Not only does stock go down to 105, it goes to 95, it goes to 50. So as you can see here with our uh, profit and loss chart, that's a little easier to see. She's got that protection between the put spread, the 105 and the 115. She does not have protection below that. So if that forecast is wrong and stock drops sharply south, that's where we're going to see uh, basically a naked stock position, right? Uh, she's going to lose money as the stock loses money. Our maximum profit is going to be the difference between the long stock and our short call. Remember, we bought shares uh, at X amount of dollars. We sold the call at one and a quarter. I think we bought shares for 105. Sold the call at one and a quarter. It's a $20 profit on the stock. That's going to be our max before the uh, short call gets assigned plus the dollar premium that we collected when we sold the spread to begin with. Our maximum loss, if we get assigned, well, that's, that's where we're going to have the problem. We've got, uh, uh, we're forced to buy shares at 105. That's our uh, assignment risk on that short put. Theoretically, stock can go down to zero. So we don't have as much protection on the, uh, uh, we don't have as much protection if stock absolutely plummets and uh, you know, and the world start, stops spitting, but she's not looking for that. She's just looking for that small window at worst. So we've got that protection, 105 to 115. Now, another example that I want to look at, again, we're always looking to do something new. It's called the laddered collar. Now, the laddered collar is kind of a combination uh, of everything. It's, it's best to look at it as an example. Basically, what we're doing is we're buying a put, whether it's long or short term, and rather than selling a short call against it, we're going to be selling several short calls against it. And obviously, this is a position that you take if you've got more than 100 shares of stock. So let's say you've got 500 shares of stock in our example. 500 shares of stock, theoretically, you can sell, you can buy five puts and sell five puts against it, right, for it to have a perfect hedge. But rather than sell five calls at the same strike, maybe we sell five calls at various strikes uh, and various expiries as well, like a ladder. So in our example, we've got long-term protection. We're buying a six-month 85-strike uh, put. We're buying those for $4 each. Because we've got 500 shares, we're buying protection on all 500 shares. We buy five of these puts. We decide, because we like to trade and because we're looking to maximize whatever profit we possibly can, we're going to sell a short dated, a 30-day call against it. We're going to sell a 60-day call against it. We're going to sell a, a four-month call against it. And we're going to sell two six-month calls against it. Right? Traders love to trade. So we've got all that protection. Uh, you can see here the prices that we came up with uh, for the strategy gives us a net debit of $1,165. Now, she's got $50,000 worth of stock that we're looking to protect. That protection is going to cost $1,100. Certainly nothing uh, you know, uh, unreasonable. What ifs, right? Just like with all the other strategies. What if the stock goes up? What if the stock goes down? What if the stock doesn't move? What's going to happen? If the stock makes a sharp move in either direction, let's say a, a sharp move down, again, the same scenario. Do we want to exercise that put and let the shares go? Do we want to roll the position out? Do we want to buy those, shir those uh, short calls that we have? Do we want to buy those back for a profit? So the stock goes down, price of the put goes up, price of the calls go down, we can maybe buy everything back for a profit. Do we want to do that? If stock goes the other way, 
do we want to uh, risk assignment of those short calls? Right now we've got half a dozen, or I think in this example five, we've got a, you know, five or six different expirations that we need to manage and we need to be cognizant of. What is our management going to be with that? Do we want to buy back the shorter dated ones to avoid assignment? Do we want to roll them out? Uh, again, all questions that we need to ask. The problem is regardless of what we do, those shorter dated calls obviously have a smaller premium amount than the longer dated. So unless the strategy works for us as we intend, uh, it may not be as uh, financially beneficial because we're collecting less money up front. In this case, we're actually paying for it. So definitely something to think about. Uh, we really appreciate your support of the OIC and our webinar series and our live seminar series. So uh, again, thank you all for joining us. Very much appreciate that. If you want to talk to us, if you have questions for us, shoot us an email. We're around and we're happy to help.